All right, guys, chapter five, Julius Caesar, the assassination, Michael Parenti, <clears throat> Cicero's witch hunt. Again, these chapters start with a quote from Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, act one, scene three. But men may construe things after their fashion, clean from the purpose of the things themselves. Here we go. The great orator Marcus Tullius Cicero looms large in any consideration of the late republic. He was a key participant in its affairs and his writings constitute by far the largest surviving primary source we have of that era. Moreover, his ideological proclivities dovetail with those of regiments of historians down through the ages, making him a great favorite among them. Sir Ronald Syme hails Cicero as a humane and cultivated man, an enduring influence upon the course of all European civilizations. Other admirers trumpet him as a constitutionalist of honorable and unselfish ideals, a leader devoted to standards of duty, kindliness, and public spirit, singularly genuine, refined, and lovable. One of Rome's leading sons and most precious gems who refused to live under a tyranny. Almost everyone shares that opinion of Cicero. <clears throat> Contemporary American and British ancient historians are divided between Cicero, Ciceronians, 95% and Caesarians, a mere handful, and the division reflects their current political attitudes, observes Arthur Kahn, one of the handful. Another of the handful is Friedrich Engels, who calls Cicero the most contemptible scoundrel in history. Born in Arpinum, a municipality southeast of Rome of a wealthy equestrian family, Cicero went to Rome for his education and eventually established himself as the city's leading barrister. Barrister? Barrister? Early in his career, he proved himself an able mouthpiece for the aristocracy by successfully pleading the cases of large numbers of young men of illustrious and noble families, accused of ill discipline and cowardice in war. Quaestor in 75, a deal in 69, and Praetor in 66, he forged links with leading citizens whenever possible, learning the locations of their town and country dwellings and what friends and neighbors they had. For all this prodigious cow towing to the nobles, they never considered him much more than a useful upstart. Cicero himself fretted about their ingratitude. They have never made me the slightest return or recompense, material or even verbal. In 56, he complained of certain gentlemen who objected to his owning a villa that once belonged to a leading optimate. When the aristocratic Metellus sneeringly asked Cicero, who was your father, and must have cut the orator's heart, we can forgive his retort and even favor it with a smile. I can scarcely ask you the same question since your mother has made it rather difficult to answer. Cicero fumed in particular about Brutus's gauchery and declining his hospitality and for taking a brusque, arrogant, ungracious tone toward me even when he is asking for a favor. Yet he managed to convince himself that Brutus was very fond of him. At one point he concluded rather plaintively, Now it's time for me to love myself since they won't love me whatever I do. And love himself he did. Dio Cassius notes that Cicero was the greatest boaster alive and thought no equal to himself. A self-enriching slaveholder, slumlord, and senator, Cicero deplored even the palest moves toward democracy. Rulers, he insisted, should always be persons of affluent class. When you appoint a judge, it is perfectly proper to be guided by considerations of property and rank. In 66, when Gaius Manilius, a people's tribune, introduced a law that granted freed men the right to vote along with their former masters, Cicero was part of the senatorial majority that immediately rejected it. He also denounced the secret ballot introduced several generations earlier in 139 BC by Aulus Gabinius, a tribune and grandson of a slave, who Cicero dismissed as a vulgar and insignificant fellow. The secret ballot made it easier for the plebes to do mischief, he believed. It was a subterfuge that ensured the secrecy of a wrong-headed vote, thus keeping the aristocracy in the dark about what each man thought. He regarded the people as worthless groundlings akin to criminals and degenerates. The common herd, the masses and worst elements, many of them simply out for revolution. He denounced those of pedestrian occupation, the artisans and shopkeepers and all that kind of scum who align themselves with dangerous demagogues, the wretched half-starved commoners who attend mass meetings and suck the blood of the treasury. To him, their restiveness was an outgrowth of their own personal malevolence rather than a response to unforgiving material circumstances. 
Privately, he referred to my army of the rich and noted that the safety of the state is to the advantage of all good men, but most clearly benefits men of fortune, which was the way he thought it should be. In 59, he wrote to his wealthy confidant, Atticus, My only policy now is hatred of the radicals. While unsparingly praised by generations of classicists for his principled ways, Cicero was often an unprincipled opportunist and, dis and disassembler. In 50 BC, for example, with Caesar's fame and power ascendant, he persuaded the Senate to decree a thanksgiving service in Caesar's, in Caesar's honor, and himself delivered a hypocritical pan panegyric, which he privately recanted shortly thereafter in a letter to Atticus. I was not exactly proud of my palinode, but good night to principle, sincerity, and honor. Celebrated throughout the ages as a champion of constitutionalism, Cicero actually was quite capable of playing fast with constitutional rights. His role in what became as the Catiline Conspiracy affords sorry evidence of this. Born of an old patrician family in decline, Lucius Sergius Catiline had served with Sola in his occupation of Rome and participated in the dictator's ruthless proscriptions in 81 80 BC. After holding several magistries over the years, he was indicted for extortion while serving as governor of Africa in 66, but won acquittal. About this time, Catiline emerged as a late blooming popular re. Most writers see Catiline as propelled purely by ambition, lacking any dedicated attachment to the popular cause. But he did take up the cudgel on behalf of the poor with pronouncements like the following. Ever since the state fell under the jurisdiction and sway of a few powerful men, it is always they who receive tribute from foreign kings and princes and raking taxes from every people and tribe. Thus all influence, power, office, and wealth are in their hands or where they choose to bestow them. All they leave for us is danger, defeat, prosecutions, and poverty. Catalines, diatribes registered in Cicero's mind as nothing less than subversion, a revolutionary assault upon the Constitution and all of Roman society. He charged Catalin with plotting murderous deeds to grab state power, writing 20 years after the event, Sallust, though no friend of Cicero's, uncritically accepts all of Cicero's worst criminations. He maintains that Catalin and a confederate made ready to assassinate the consuls elect on 1 January 65 and grab the offices for themselves. Because their murderous intent was discovered, they postponed its execution until 5 February, when they planned to destroy most of the senators as well as the consuls. But Catiline was in too great a hurry to give the signal to his accomplices in front of the Senate House, a search Sallust, and the attack never came off. Hence they failed in what would have been the most heinous crime in the annals of Rome. It is often the case Sallust leaves us with more questions than answers. He does not explain how the conspirators could hope to make themselves consuls by murdering the two consuls elect. And once uncovered, why were they not prosecuted by the authorities? Instead, they felt perfectly free to reschedule their skullduggery for the following month, even escalating, even escalating it to include the massacre of hundreds of senators. Then why was this grandiose scheme permanently called off merely because of a premature signal? In 64, acting not at all like an aspiring mass murderer, Catiline waged an electoral campaign for counsel, perhaps with the backing of Crassus and Caesar, gathering much popular support in the doing. In an attempt to stop him, the nobles reluctantly threw their weight behind Cicero's candidacy. The problem with Cicero was that he was a novice homo, a new man, the first in his family. <clears throat> a new man, the first in his family ever to serve in the Senate. <coughs> Excuse me. The Roman nobility was composed of individuals, both patrician and plebeian, who could claim a consul in their lineage, in their lineage. Occasionally, the nobles recruited a candidate for consulship and thereby for the aristocracy whose senatorial ancestry, whose, whose senatorial ancestry had stopped at a lower office. But rarely were they denied, or but rarely were they deigned to support a novice homo, a new man, someone like Cicero, who had no, who had no senatorial ancestors whatsoever. Salus, himself a novice homo, explains it. A self-made man, however distinguished he might be or however admirable his achievements, was invariably considered unworthy of the consulship, almost as if he were unclean. But by 64, Cicero was proving himself a capable paladin or paladin to the plutocracy, while Catiline was emerging as a patrician turncoat who roiled the optimates with bruising broadsides calling for debt cancellation and land redistribution. Forced to choose between their class snobbery and their class interest, the oligarchs decided on their interest. 
When necessity dictates, every ruling class has recruited serviceable talent from the ranks below. So the optimates held their noses and threw their weight behind the pushy orbiter from Arpanum. By being the first man in his family to hold a consulship, a new man thereby won aristocratic status for himself and his descendants. It was a relatively rare achievement, and it was Cicero's, as he never tired of reminding others. In 64 campaign, Cicero drew upon the advice set down by his brother Quintus in a manual summarizing their discussions about campaign tactics. He was to avoid specific issues and generally represent himself as an unflinching upholder of the Senate's authority, devoted to orderly rule and the reactionary Solon constitution. At the same time, he was to heap slander upon his opponents, Antonius and Catiline, several other candidates posed no serious challenge, defaming them as two assassins from boyhood, both libertines, both paupers, charging Catiline with being so cunningly efficient in his lust that he has raped children in smocks practically at their parents' knees. At one point in the campaign, when a radical tribune denounced Cicero as unworthy of a consular post, he responded by charging the tribune with being part of a fell design that threatened the commonwealth. From then on, conspiracy and subversion would remain Cicero's theme in the electoral campaign throughout his consulship and for much of his life. He would stigmatize any attempt at reform as part of a larger stratagem to subvert the Republic. In the summer of 64, Cicero and, a and Antonius and Antoni Antonius in the summer of 64, Cicero and Antonius won election as consuls to serve in 63. Catiline or Catiline was defeated by a narrow margin. Through a combination of bribery and threat, the financially strapped Antonius was dissuaded from exercising a restraining veto on his consul, leaving Cicero with the free hand to act as he wished. In 63, Catiline waged another campaign for the consulship to serve in 62. Cicero had the election delayed until late in the summer after many of Catiline's supporters were obliged to return to the provincial homes, thereby contributing to his second defeat. At the time, Cicero informed the Senate that Catiline had planned to assassinate him. The charge was never, the charge was never clearly explained and failed to convince the senators. During his tenure in office, Cicero lifted out a finger on behalf of the people and vigorously opposed all reform proposals. He and his Senate collaborators quashed motions designed to cancel debts, affect land, redistrib no, affect land distribution, and allow the offspring of those exiled by Sulla to occupy public office. As his undistinguished consulship was winding down to its final months, he escalated his vendetta against Catiline, charging him with orchestrating a revolutionary conspiracy of immense proportions. Catiline supposedly was pursuing this diabolic design throughout 63. At the very time, he was energetically campaigning for the consulship. Here was a crisis that might serve Cicero famously. With little time left in office to mark his own greatness, the vigilant consul would leap into the fray, close the breach, and stay the perpetrator's hand. This fear, he insisted, would cause future generations to sing hosannas to his name, as indeed they have. All they needed was a prominent but not overly powerful enemy who could be identified with the lower classes. The defeated Catiline fit the bill perfectly. The unrest in certain provinces only added to the alarmist atmosphere that Cicero, that Cicero was confecting. In Eturia, which is Tuscany, impoverished army veterans, aggrieved smallholders, and dispossessed farmers were arming themselves and rallying around their leader, Manlius. <coughs> As Manlius explained in his declaration to the Roman proconsul, our, our object in taking up arms is not to attack our country or to endanger others, but to protect ourselves from wrong. We are poor needy wretches. The cruel harshness of moneylenders has robbed most of us of our homes. We are not seeking dominion or riches. We beseech you in the Senate to rescue unhappy fellow citizens. We, de we beseech you in the Senate to rescue your unhappy fellow citizens, to restore to us the legal protection snatched from us. Manlius sounded more like someone petitioning for a redress of grievances than a rebel, breathing insurrectionary hellfire. Still, Cicero damned him for being in league with Catiline in a campaign to destroy Rome. Manlius, Manlius and his supporters had backed Catiline in the previous election, but there was nothing to indicate that they were collaborating in an impending revolution. In Rome, anonymous letters were sent to leading senators warning of a massacre. One nervous senator read a letter on the Senate floor reporting that disgruntled veterans were massing in Eturia, which is Tuscany, to descend upon Rome on 27 October, at which time the city would be set aflame by revolutionary incendiaries lurking within its gates. On 1 November, other rebels would seize Palestrina, a town just east of Rome. 
and from there launch an attack upon the city. No one called for an investigation of the wild claims proffered in these letters, nor of the letters themselves so mysteriously distributed. Cicero's Jeremiads were having their intended effect. The Senate passed a Senatus Consultum Ultimum, suspending the Constitution and giving the Consul extraordinary emergency powers. Panic and gloom seized certain sectors of the city. As often happens, people saw evidence of the menace and the very precautions taken against it. Senators and other notables packed and fled. Private residences and government buildings were left unattended. Investment values plunged, but 27 October came and went. So too the 1st of November, and nothing happened. No army took the field in Eturia. No insurgents seized Palestrina. Rome went unmolested. At about this time, Catiline offered to place himself under Cicero's custody in order that he be as free as possible from suspicion of promoting insurrection. Cicero refused to accommodate him. It better served his purpose to have his prey skulking about as an untrammeled menace. Catiline voluntarily took up residence at the house of Metallus Nepos, the praetor, in a display of good faith. In contrast, Cicero took to accompanying himself with a large contingent of bodyguards and began wearing a breastplate a breastplate beneath his clothes that he would purposely uncover, treating these well-advertised precautions as further evidence of Catiline's diabolic intent. On 7 November 63, Cicero convened an extraordinary meeting of the Senate. While many senators doubted his charges, they dared not risk putting themselves under suspicion by challenging him. When Catiline entered the house, his colleagues shrank from greeting him or sitting near him. As Cicero gleefully pointed out, their timorous reaction to the climate of fear only reinforced it. The consul launched into his speech, accusing Catiline of actually plotting the destruction of every single one of us and all of Rome, and of all Rome, and of everything upon the face of the earth. Catiline was determined to plunge the entire world into fire and slaughter. His conspiracy constituted the most ferocious and appalling and deadly menace to our country. He and his confederates were ready to besiege the Senate House with their swords and mobilize their firebombs and brands to plunge the city into flames. In subsequent invective, Cicero was to repeat this charge again and again. Catiline intended to burn down the entire city and kill you all. His goal was nothing less than the extermination of the Roman people. Cicero addressed Catiline directly as a man of evil spirit who had launched repeated attempts upon Cicero's own life. Although I was well aware that although I was well aware that my death would be a disaster to our state, I employed only my unaided endeavors to frustrate your plots. There are all your attempts, for example, to kill myself. Many of your dagger thrusts were so lethal that it seemed they could not fail to hit their mark. All the same, by some sort of sideways movement or dodge, I managed to elude them. Ten years later, Cicero would gain. Ten years later, Cicero would again portray himself as the moving target of a popular re. Many is the time that I have narrowly managed to escape from Publius Claudius' weapons and gory hands, or Publius Claudius's weapons and gory hands. One can only marvel at how the fleshy orator nimbly evaded his presumably determined assailants. During his speech in the Senate, Cicero repeatedly indulged in threats against Catiline's life, knowing that he was timing Catiline's execution to coincide with the roundup of other like-minded black guards. To convince the Senate that summary executions were not without precedent, he repeatedly and approvingly mentioned the murder of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus and the other leaders of high social rank on mere suspicion of treason. But many senators found the charges hard to believe, which probably explains why they made no attempt to detain Catiline. Sensing that he was not carrying his audience, Cicero criticized those colleagues who refused to see the disasters that menaced them. And again the next day before the assembly, he complained that there were quite a number of people who did not believe what I was telling them. Nevertheless, the orator's repeated accusations managed to create a witch hunt atmosphere that Catiline's calm denials could not sufficiently dispel. The dispirited Catiline quitted Rome the night after Cicero's first invective. If we are to believe him, he departed not to organize a revolutionary opposition in Italy, but reluctantly, when the council's denunciations and threats in the Senate made his position untenable, causing him to fear for his life. Catiline dispatched letters to men of consular rank and other members of the aristocracy, describing himself as beset by false accusations and unable to cope with the intrigues of his enemies. He informed them that he would go into exile at Massilia, which is Marseille. Or Marseille. Within days after his departure, Catiline must have had second thoughts about exile. Instead of going to Massilia, he joined the rest of denizens led by Manlius and Eturia. That he had intended to do so all along has been 
the accepted opinion among most historians, beginning with Cicero. Indeed, it is possible that he lied in order to throw any pursuers off his track. It is just as likely that he changed his mind as he issued forth. He realized he could never expect to return to Rome and live unmolested, and he feared being hunted down by the consul's armed guards while abroad. In any case, a fearful barren life in exile did not fit his temperament, so he embarked upon one last desperate gambit, joining the dispossessed in northern Italy, who were now taking up arms to defend themselves for, from foreclosures and usurious debt collectors. This is suggested in the letter produced by the arch-conservative Quintus Catullus, which he said came from Catiline. It read in part, I was provoked by wrongs and insults and found myself unable to maintain a position of dignity, so I openly undertook the championship of the oppressed, as I had often done before. It was because I saw unworthy men promoted to honorable, honorable positions and felt myself treated as an outcast on account of unjust suspicions. That is why I have adopted a course of action amply justified in my present circumstances, which offers a hope of saving what is left of my honor. I intended to write at greater length, but news has come that they are preparing to use force against me. When word of Catiline's arrival in Etruria, so it's not Etruria, it's Etruria, reached Rome, the Senate declared him and manly as public enemies. On 9 November, before the assembly, Cicero delivered a set piece in the art of demonization. <clears throat> Imagine every type of criminality and wickedness that you can think of. Catiline has been behind them all. In the whole of Italy, there is not a single prisoner, gladiator, robber, assassin, parasite, will forger, cheat, glutton, adulterer, prostitute, corrupter of youth, or youth who has been corrupted. Indeed, any nasty individual of any kind, whatever, who will not be obliged to admit he has been Catiline's intimate. Whenever all through these years there has been a murder, the murderer has been he. Catiline even encouraged his young male lovers to murder their parents and personally lent a hand in such misdeeds. Cicero assured the assembly. The orator did not explain why the depraved patrician had never been prosecuted for any of these horrific exploits. Cicero's strategy was enjoying some success. Demonize and, I isolate, <clears throat> demonize and isolate Catiline, push him to the wall, and goad him into an act of unlawful resistance, all the while creating a climate of alarm within the city. The orator come savior would then use the perilous emergency as an opportunity to restore in the manner of Sulla the unchallenged authority of the inner circle of aristocratic senators, thereby earning their eternal gratitude and winning supreme glory for himself. Still, the lurid scenario he conjured was wanting in one essential component, evidence. Not one person had been harmed, not a house torched, not an arms cachet uncovered, not a hilltop or vantage point seized by the insurrectionists, not a trace of anything nefarious afoot, not a perpetrator rooted out and, and apprehended. The squadrons of incendiaries and armed cadres never materialized. Subversion and mass murder were nowhere to be found except in the hy hyperbolic screeds emanating from the overheated consul. With Catalina now ensconced in Etruria, another month passed and still nothing materialized. Cicero, Cicero easily explained why the insurrection had been stymied by his unmatchable vigilance. I myself am on guard. The interests of our country are in my watchful care, and my courage, wisdom, and foresight have preserved the state from the gravest of perils. A dramatic turn came on 3 December when an excited Cicero summoned the Senate into another emergency session. He announced that he had planted informers in a secret clique of aristocrats who were confederates of Catiline. Acting on tips from his undercover agents, he had arrested a delegation of Allobrogues from Gaul who were in Rome seeking redress from the extortions of Roman officials and usurers. A certain Umbrinus, a moneylender active in Gaul and probably an agent of Cicero, approached the unsuspecting Gauls and informed them of Catiline's conspiracy to overthrow the Roman Republic. He even named the conspirators, fearing that they were being set up by a provocateur. The Allobroges informed a senator who regularly acted as their patron in Rome. He in turn informed Cicero, probably not realizing that he was thereby drawing the Gauls into the consul's net. The next morning, Cicero had the Allobrogian envoys arrested as they were wending their way out of the city, along with someone named Titus Voltursius, a provincial Italian who supposedly had entered in league with Catiline's conspirators. The envoys were now implicated. Either they cooperated with the promise of ample monetary reward or risked dire retribution. <clears throat> the, 
The Gauls chose to cooperate fully with Cicero. Following his instructions, they managed to get introduced to the aristocratic conspirators and asked from them a written undertaking under their personal seals that the Allobroges, Allobroges could carry to their countrymen. Cicero then summoned the aristocrats who, acting not at all like guilty conspirators, obligingly answered his call only to find themselves under arrest. It was to be suspected, Con writes, that Umbrinus himself was in Cicero's hire, and Volturcius, the conspirator caught along with the Gauls, was almost certainly a paid informant. He had only recently joined the conspiracy and, upon capture with inordinate alacrity, offered to turn state's evidence. <coughs> Give me one sec. Cicero, from what Michael Parenti writes, Sounds like a crazy guy. Uh, <clears throat> my throat got itchy. So Volturcius corroborated with the whole litany of horrors Cicero had been highlighting. He claimed that at a signal for an uprising, he claimed that at a signal for an uprising, youths of noble families were to murder their fathers. But Cicero did not press Volturcius to name any of the prospective. Parasides. Parasides is like somebody who kills their mom or father. The letters of the apprehended aristocrats reveal no precise evidence of criminal intent and probably were primarily statements of support for the Allobroges' redress of grievances. If they had contained mention of arson, massacre, or seizing state power, we certainly would have heard about it from Cicero. Still, the orator held forth about the impending apocalypse. He noted that when Catiline had broken out of the city a few days ago, Actually, Catalan had departed unimpeded nearly a month before. He left behind him at Rome the associates of his odious designs, the ferocious leaders whose madness and malignancy knew no limits. One of these mad and malignant conspirators, <clears throat> was none other than Publius Lentulus Sura, an eminent praetor and former consul, a friend of Catalan's, and Mark Antony's stepfather. Lentulus had written a supportive letter to Catiline, which Volturcius supposedly was asked to deliver. It urged Catiline to stand firm and enlist the aid of all, even of the lowest classes. That being the only portion of Lentulus's letter that Cicero quotes, and therefore the only portion known to us, we might expect it is the most damaging. Yet it hardly bespeaks a sinister conspiracy to destroy Rome. Stand firm in the face of unrelenting calumny is not exactly a call to overthrow the state and butcher all its inhabitants. Rather, Lentulus seems to be calmly advising his friend to rally enough support to withstand Cicero's onslaught. And if Catiline and Lentulus had long been conspiring with armed slaves and plebes, then, then Lentulus' suggestion that he enlist even the lowest classes seemed oddly redundant and out of date with what supposedly already had been brewing among the conspirators. Appearing in the forum later that day, Cicero announced that it was now conclusively proven that Catiline planned to invade Rome and massacre the entire citizenry. The five confederates had been plotting an insurrection from within, and Lentulus intended to make himself king of Rome. Another conspirator, Cathegus, a, a man of some wealth, possessed a private collection of fancy high-priced daggers and swords that Cicero eagerly confiscated and treated as the arsenal intended for Catiline's rogue army. The five were guilty, Cicero assured the assembled crowd. More conclusive than any evidence was their pallor, the look in their eyes, the set of their features, their silence. As they stood there, stupefied, gazing fixedly upon the ground or occasionally glancing furtively at one another, their guilt was quite as manifest from their own appearance as from anyone else's testimony. A different conclusion is reached by the few dissenting historians who note that the evidence against the five had been proffered by informants of questionable credibility and that the accused had not been allowed to cross-examine their accuser in any systematic fashion. To any senator retaining a modicum of common sense, it was clear that the hullabaloo was out of all proportion to the events. A coterie of sympathizers had tried to mobilize support for their friend Catiline, but were they planning arson, murder, and revolution? If so, by what means? It was not with an invisible army of plebs and slave, slaves, nor was it with Manlius and his veterans who petitioned the Roman proconsul only for land reform and relief from taxes and debts, nor with the Allobroges who were petitioning for grievances of their own and who gave no evidence of planning a Gallic, a Gallic invasion of Rome. The following day, 4 December, as Sallus tells it, a certain Lucius Tarquinius was brought before the full Senate house. 
He claimed to have been on his way to join Catiline when he was arrested. Why the authorities thought he was suspect, Salas does not say. Told to speak by Cicero, Tarquinius readily related a story Taylor made to support Cicero's charges and strikingly similar to the one spun by Voltercius. But Tarquinius also claimed that he had been sent by Marcus Crassus to instruct Catiline to prepare his attack with all due haste. The mention of Crassus, an aristocratic possessed of immense wealth and prestige, had an unsettling effect on the Senate. It was one thing that Crassus may have supported Catiline for counsel and bailed him out in an earlier extortion case, but something else to accuse him of plotting to overthrow the Roman government. Could the commander who had ruthlessly crushed Spartacus's slave rebellion in 71 now be leading a slave rebellion of his own? Could the richest landlord in Rome now want to torch his own properties? Some senators found Tarquinius's statement beyond belief. Others thought it best not to provoke a powerful man like Crassus, regardless of how true or untrue the allegation against him. The full house swiftly declared the charges to be false and decreed that Tarquinius be kept in custody until he revealed the name of the person who had put him up to such testimony. Some suspected that Tarquinius had been suborned by Cicero in an attempt to undermine Crassus, who had developed the habit of working with reform-minded leaders, including the popular Pompey, who at that moment was in Asia on a military campaign. Salus writes at a later date, I actually heard Crassus declare with his own lips that this infamous accusation against him had been made by Cicero. Two leading optimists, Catullus and Piso, nursing political and personal grievances against Julius Caesar, against Julius Caesar urged Cicero to enlist informants to bear false witness against him, but Cicero, perhaps mindful of how the charge against Crassus had redounded with ill effect, refused to risk it. Catullus and Piso then took matters into their own hands, circulating falsehoods that they pretended to have heard from Valtercius or Allobroges or the Allobroges, provoking enough feeling against Caesar to cause armed knights, strong partisans of Cicero's, to threaten him with their swords as he exited the Senate House. On 5 December 63, the Senate held a momentous session. Various senators now came forward with incriminating testimony against the five Catalan conspirators. Consul-elect Salanus, a Cicero collaborator, declared that Carthagus had marked him and seven other high-ranking senators for death. Salanus offered no evidence to support the startling indictment, nor did he explain why he had waited until now to report it. Cethagus, Lentulus, and other conspirators should suffer the extremist fate, he demanded a cry taken up by other senators. With the conspirators' fate seemingly sealed, Julius Caesar took the floor. Still four years away from his first consulship, Caesar already was a leading figure in Roman politics, identified with the popular faction. Calmly, he urged the senators upon a different course, reminding them of their constitutional duty. He could not countenance he could not countenance putting the accused to death without a trial. Instead, he recommended keeping them in close custody until further investigation and adjudication. Surely now was not the time to do something rash and irreversible and certainly unconstitutional, something that might only generate a still graver crisis. Here Caesar was alluding to the possibility that the executions might rouse disturbances among the people, many of whom had taken to Catiline's late-blooming populism. Caesar's measured remarks, writes Plutarch, wrought such change in the opinions of the Senate, which was in fear of the people, that even Salanus hastily announced that he too had not meant death when he called for the extremist fate, but incarceration, which to a freedom-loving Roman was far worse than death. <clears throat> so Caesar... He urged the senators upon a different course, reminding them of their constitutional duty. He could not countenance putting the accused to death without a trial. He recommended keeping them in close custody. Okay. Catalyst took the floor and sputtered in rage against the course urged by Caesar. He was followed by another optimate leader, the young Cato, who angrily taxed Salanus for his recantation, then assailed Caesar for using the cover of humane words while trying to subvert the state, seeking to frighten the Senate in a case which he himself had much to fear. Here Cato was accusing Caesar of being secretly in league with Catiline. Why else would he would he essay why else would he essay to rescue enemies who had brought the country to the brink of ruin and whose deaths would free the state from great slaughter and perils? While Cato, while Cato had the floor, it happened that a messenger delivered a note to Caesar. Seeing an opportunity to fix suspicion, Cato cried out that even now as he spoke, Caesar was communicating with enemies of the Commonwealth. Cato bade him to read the missive aloud, 
Instead, Caesar rose and handed the sheaf to Cato, who unhappily discovered it to be a ballet dow from his very own half-sister, Servilia, the mother of Brutus, who long had been engaged in a, in a notorious liaison with Caesar, who had long been engaged in a, in a, uh, who had long been engaged in a notorious liaison with Caesar. Plutarch describes her as being madly in love with him. In a distemper, Cato threw the note back at Caesar, snapping, Keep it, you drunkard. And Ali, an opposite epithet, since Caesar was known to be a temperate imbiber. And the note pertained to a different sort of intoxication experienced by Servilia. Though his ploy against Caesar backfired, Cato turned the tide of opinion. The jittery senators voted to condemn the accused to death. That evening, under Cicero's direct supervision, the jittery senators voted to condemn, to condemn the accused to death. That same evening, under Cicero's direct supervision, Lentulus, Sitigius, Statilius, Gabinius, and Caparius were taken to prison, one by one lowered into a dank, foul chamber, and strangled to death. Other conspirators of lesser known were rounded up in Rome and elsewhere in Italy. Under the law, under the law, now that this consulship had expired, Cicero held court in his home. Some of the accused were put to death on the testimony of an informer. Others were acquitted. Some supposed to be guilty were allowed to escape. In a polemic sometimes attributed to Salus, an anonymous critic notes that several among the accused who offered Cicero sumptuous gifts, including a house, a Tusculan villa, and a Pompeian villa, escaped retribution. But those who could not afford such favors were charged with plotting against the Senate, and Cicero was certain of their guilt. Some weeks later, Catiline and his poorly armed band in Etruria, beleaguered by Roman legions, closing in from north and south of them, fought valiantly in what was essentially a defensive action. Catiline was killed, and the Etrurian force was crushed. No prisoners were taken. For the next 20 years, Cicero tirelessly credited himself with having preserved the state and having delivered the Senate House from massacre, describing his crusade against Catiline as the grandest deed in the history of the human race. He had to admit that the only citizen the Republic could not do without was myself. In a letter to Lucius Lucius, who was writing a history of Rome lost to us, Cicero asked him to use his genius to eulogize the role that he, Cicero, had played in the city's history with even more warmth than perhaps you feel, and in that respect, to disregard the canons of history by writing with a partiality that enhances my merits even to exaggeration in your eyes. Even a little more than may be allowed by truth. This would help bring the vindication of my claims to everlasting renown. For if a man has once transgressed the bounds of modesty, the best he can do is to be shameless out and out. Cicero's tireless redomitade became the accepted opinion among intellectuals through the ages. Phileas, Patriculus, Plutarch, Juvenal, Lucan, Dio Cassius, Florus, and other ancient writers praised him almost as much as he praised himself for having thwarted a pestiferous conspiracy against Rome and all its upstanding citizens. Likewise, most modern-day historians accept Cicero's account of how he rescued the city from Catiline's clutches. They write of the firm evidence he produced, the diligence and care that spread, that spared Rome from fire and sword. His brilliant statecraft, quick, decisive, and courageous action, and prompt countermeasures. For those of us less enamored with the great orator, troubling questions remain, beginning with the more implausible charges. If the alleged conspirators sought to become masters of Rome, why were they intent upon wiping out the city and every single individual, menacing our country with annihilation, as Cicero claimed? Why would they want to preside over a heap of corpses and burnt rubble? Catiline's secret band of confederates, according to Cicero, was composed of debtors, gamblers, layabouts, parasites, assassins, debauchers, effeminate degenerates, and louch characters of every sort. How could the arch-villain hope to overthrow the Roman Empire with such a raggle-taggle bound of wastrels and misfits? Given Catiline's bloodthirsty designs, why were no murders committed? Assassination was hardly an unknown accomplishment in Roman politics, yet Catiline and his bumbling gang seemed never to get the hang of it. The two consuls-elect were supposedly targeted in the January 65 murder plot, but nothing happened. As for the plot to kill hundreds of senators the following month, again nothing happened. There was a report widely publicized by Cicero of two Catiline conspirators who were appointed conspirators who were appointed to kill him. But when denied entry into his house, they departed without a murmur and never bothered him again. Cicero claimed, I had almost been murdered in my own home, but why did he not have them arrested for conspiracy to commit murder? Why he why did he not uh, 
Why did he not produce them and his anonymous informant for public questioning? Again, nothing developed. Commentators cannot even agree on the identity of these two lackadaisical perpetrators. Salas is sure it was Cornelius and Farjuntaeus, Plutarch fingers Marcius and Cathegis, Apian accuses Lentillus and Cathegis, Dio gives no names, Suetonius and Valeus do not even mention the incident, and Cicero himself is oddly vague, saying only that it was two Roman equestrians, which rules out most of the above. Cicero refers to attempts against several other individuals and an attempt to kill Catiline's com competitors on the consular committee of 63. Again, nothing happened. And what evidence was there that Catiline repeatedly assaulted Cicero with a dagger, but apparently in so ungainly a fashion as to be thwarted by the consul's sidesteps? Why didn't Cicero have Catiline arrested for the attempts upon his life? <clears throat> Catiline and his accomplices were ignominious failures. Also went okay. Catiline and his accomplices and his accomplices were ignominious failures. Also, when it came to arson attacks, if you can believe Salas, Catiline enlisted a number of debauched society ladies to agitate among the city slaves and organize incendiary assaults. Incendiary assaults. Again, nothing came of it. It was said that Catiline planned to seize key points throughout the city with armed men. Again, no results. The incendiaries were supposedly forestalled by Cicero's guards. This too was difficult to believe. Rome was a tinderbox. Accidental fires were frequent and fierce. If bands of arsonists really intended to start a major conflagration, no number of guards could have prevented it. What evidence did Cicero have to support his startling charge that Catiline's friend Lentulus sought a kingship over Rome? Lentulus was doubtless mindful of how kings were abominated by the Roman people, and he was sensibly aware that he himself, albeit a fine orator, laid claim to no strong following in the forum, the senate, or the military. How then could he have hoped to achieve such a grandiose goal? Without an army, how would he have hoped to resist the jealous Pompey who, hastening back to Rome with his legions, would have dispensed with any self-proclaimed king or, for that matter, any self-installed consul such as Catiline? Why would the five accused divulge their dangerously self-incriminating secrets and letters fixed with their personal seals to foreign envoys from Gaul, with whom they had no previous connection? Cicero himself was aware that this incredible scenario craved explanation. His answer delivered before the assembly on the afternoon of 3 December was that divine forces caused him to blunder. Lentulus and the other traitors in our midst would never have been such madmen as to entrust these vital intrigues and communications to people who were both strangers and barbarians, unless the gods themselves had denuded their outrageous scheme of every shred of discretion. Before the Senate, Cicero claimed, Gentlemen, I feel conscious that the will and guidance of the immortal gods have been directly behind every single thing I have arranged. This from a man who privately debunked the auspices and other religious beliefs. Given the supposedly massive dimensions of the plot, why was there no evidence other than the dubious testimony of several informants who simply reiterated the charges leveled in Cicero's invectives? Rewards were offered for information about the plot. For a slave, the prize was freedom and 100,000 setter seas, about 10 years earning for the average laborer. For a free man, double that sum and a pardon for any share he had in the conspiracy. Salus notes that not a man among all the conspirators was induced by the promise of reward to betray their plans. As usual, Salus does not question further, but we might ask, why did not one feckless turncoat issue forth with information in order to pocket the sumptuous reward and save his own skin. Most probably the conspiracy was not betrayed because it did not exist, at least not to the phantasmal extent conjured by Cicero. On 29 December, the last day of his consulship, Cicero attempted to make a farewell speech lauding his year in office, but the assembled crowd would not allow him to utter a word besides his oath. Instead, they hooted him down for executing Roman citizens without a fair trial and without the consent of the people. In vehement protestation, the orator shouted back that the safety of the state and city is due to my efforts alone and boast that only succeeded in inciting still more anger from the crowd. Or a boast that only succeeded in inciting still more anger from the crowd. Cicero had hoped that his renown as Rome's deliverer would prevail throughout the ages. So Cicero hoped that his renown as Rome's deliverer would prevail throughout the ages, and so it has among many classicists, but among the sensible commoners of Rome, his self-anointed glory endured for hardly a day. <laughs> there we are. Peace.